this. All of us in this room have faced our fair share of trials and tribulations. It's very quiet in here. I know that throughout my life, you know, and, and, and in seasons in my life, I have lost jobs. I have lost loved ones. People have stabbed me in the back. People have betrayed me. People have disappointed me. People have lied to me. They have stolen from me. You know, I have had some heartbreaks in my life, some health scares. Days where I felt so hopeless that I didn't feel like I was going to make it. But if I look back today, regardless of all of these things that has happened in my life, I'm still here today. And I'm sure today that I'm not the only one. I know that many of you in this place have faced far worse trials and tribulations than what I have ever could have faced in my life. But I want to say to you as well this morning, guess what? You are still here. And the enemy didn't think that you were going to make it. There were also some people who didn't think that you were going to make it. But guess what? You are still here. So I want you today to do this. I want you to give yourself a hand for still being here, whether you had all these trials, these tribulations, you are still here, you still made it, so give yourself a hand. I think you can applaud yourself better than that. You see, and that brings me actually to the title of the message that I want to share with you today. And the title of the message is this. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. So I'm always amazed at the resilience of human beings. Isn't it amazing how resilient human beings can be? We live in a world where there's challenges, there's hardships, and they all inevitably, inevitably, they are part of our journey as human beings. Sometimes they seem impossible to overcome. Sometimes we feel, I will never get through this. But it is during these very moments of adversity that true strength comes through. And it is there where we experience the power to overcome the, the, the obstacles and the difficult times. And I know that these periods of time can be emotionally draining. They can test our patience. They can steal our courage. But they can even sometimes cause us to lose our determination. But I always want us to remember that just like stormy weather in life, it doesn't last. You see, storms come and storms go. And I want to prove it to you this morning. How many of you have ever gone through a trial? If you haven't put up your hand, you're lying. Okay? We all go through trials. How many of you have gone through that trial? And I want you to raise your hand high. If you've gone through a trial in your life, God has taken you through a trial in your life. And I want you to look around and I want you to see how many people have raised their hands. And when I do that, I want you to remember that just like God brought you through a trial, just like God brought all those people through a trial, He will take you through whatever trial you are going through right now. You see, we have this unconquerable spirit on the inside of us. We have a resilience that actually transforms ordinary people into extraordinary survivors. And I want to say more than survivors, conquerors. So today we are going to explore that resilience. We are going to explore that, that indomitable human spirit. And we are going to go on a journey where we are going to look at how to develop this in our lives, which I believe we already have. And by the grace of God, our inner toughness, our unwavering resolve will shape our futures. And it will ensure that we come out of the darkest moments in our lives 
with new strength, with new wisdom, and with new hope. And I want to say to you that this is not just something that we go through. In the Bible, many people went through this. And one of the people that always comes to mind is the Apostle Paul. You know, he went through much more than most Christians do. And I want us to just look at his story, see how he went through this. Listen to what he said. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24 to 28. He says, from the Jews, okay, his brothers and sisters in Christ, oh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the faith, five times I received 40 stripes. So 40 stripes, you know what 40 stripes is? Five times I received 40 stripes. They beat him with 40 stripes five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers. Does it sound familiar? In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in toil, in sleeplessness often, hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things which comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches." Can you see what happened with him? All these trials, these tribulations that Paul went through. And I think we can all identify that Paul went through some difficult times and we have gone through some difficult times. But I want you to notice he didn't quit. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. And once again, the tough times didn't last, but Paul did. The tough times didn't last, but Paul did. So, listen to how he did it. And I want you to hear from another book of the Bible, Philippians 4.13. And he said this, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was Paul's resolve. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen to how the Passion Translation says this. It says, I know what it means to lack, and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things. Did you hear that? Whether in fullness or in hunger. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. Isn't that beautiful? Listen to the Amplified. I can do all things which He has called me to do through Him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill His purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through Him who infuses inner strength and confident peace within me. Okay, so what Paul is saying in essence is he's saying, I've been through all these trials, I've been through all these difficulties, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He says that I have been trained in the secret of overcoming things. I have been trained in the secret of overcoming things. I have found that the strength of Christ's explosive power, you all know that Christ has explosive power, dunamis power that will help you overcome. And he says, I've been infused with that power to overcome every difficulty. I have been infused with that explosive power. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I'm ready for anything, equal to anything, through Him who infuses inner strength and confident peace within me. So, doesn't that sound to you like a tough person? I think Paul was one tough person. You couldn't keep him down. But it wasn't because Paul was so strong or because Paul was so talented or because Paul was all these things. It was because he learned to rely on the power of Jesus Christ. It was because he learned that it is not his own power, it is not his own strength, but it is the strength and the power of Jesus Christ that gets him through. 
So today, I want to talk about how we can develop this toughness. And I've actually got an acronym that I'm going to use to, I'm going to use the word tough as an acronym to help you develop these qualities in your life, because I believe these are the qualities of tough people. And um, someone once said this, they said that hard times create strong men and women. Hard times create strong men and women. I believe that sometimes the hard times that we go through is the exact times that is going to help us to develop strong men and women of God. That was a good place to say amen. But listen to this. Strong men, okay, creates good times. Okay, strong men and women create good times. But good times can sometimes create weak men and women. Have you noticed that? Sometimes when things are going good with certain individuals, it creates a weakness. And that is what we've experienced sometimes. We see that weakness. But the weak people, what we don't understand is that the weak people create the hard times. So it is time for us to get strong. It is time for us to get tough so that we can create the good times that God has prepared for us. And I believe that God has prepared some good times for us. Once again, a, place to, a good place to say amen. Do you believe that? Okay, so the acronym of tough that I want to share with you is the T stands for thankful. Tough people are thankful. The O stands for optimistic. Okay, tough people are optimistic. The U stands for unbreakable. Tough people are unbreakable. The G stands for growing. Tough people are always growing. And the H stands for hard working. Tough people are always hard working. So let's first of all look at the first letter there, thankful. Because tough people are T, thankful. Okay, so you all know that it is the month of November. And what do we do in the month of November? We are thankful. We are thankful that God has brought us this far. Okay, that God has brought us through another year. Do you know that there are many people that have not made it? But you are here. Okay, and it is the grace of God. So because it is the grace of God and because we are thankful, we, we, we actually we express that thankfulness. And this is what 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says out of the NIV. It says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now, it doesn't make sense for us to actually think, how can we be thankful in all circumstances? How can we be thankful in all circumstances? But I want you to notice that God didn't say we should be so thankful for the circumstances. We should be thankful in the circumstances. God doesn't expect you to be thankful for every bad thing that happens to you. He said, be thankful in all circumstances. And he went even further, Paul went even further than that, and he said, this is the will of God for you. Sometimes people ask, what is the will of God? The will of God is for us to be thankful in all circumstances. It is God's will that we remain thankful. And I think when God tells us that, He knows something that we don't know. You see... What people don't always realize is that our minds are like magnets. Okay, our minds are like magnets. We actually attract what we take into our minds and what we keep there, we attract into our lives. So if you take something into your mind and you keep it there, you attract that very same thing into your life. So if you, for instance, if you constantly think about lack, and you take that thought into your mind, guess what you're going to attract? Lack. If you constantly think about abundance and you take that thought into your, into your mind, guess what you're going to attract? Abundance. 
You see, and this works positively and negatively. If we constantly think about sickness and disease, what are you going to attract? Sickness and disease. You see, it works. It's, it's the way that God has designed this. It's the way that this works. So this also works for gratitude. If you are constantly grateful and you take those thoughts of gratefulness into your life, you will attract more to be grateful for into your life. But the opposite is also true. If you're always griping and complaining and moaning about everything in your life, guess what you're going to attract into your life? All of those negative things that you are griping and complaining and moaning about. You see, the more we do that, the more we attract it into our lives. And Steve Harvey said it this way. He said that gratitude is a powerful process. He said the only way to move to the next level, how many of you want to move to the next level in your life? The only way to move to the next level is for you to show gratitude for where you are. Sometimes we are so ungrateful about where we are. You know, maybe you are ungrateful about your work circumstances. Yes, it may be terrible, but praise God, you have a job. Maybe you are ungrateful that what you have to eat this evening, but praise God, you have something to eat. You know, we have to be grateful, and the more we are grateful, the more we will experience things to be grateful for. So, he said, if you show gratitude, it gets you to where you want to go much quicker. So, let me ask you, how has being ungrateful, complaining, helped you thus far? You see, it doesn't help us. It doesn't help us to complain and moan and be bitter all the time about everything in our lives. If we show gratitude, it will get us to where we want to go much quicker. Now, I want to say to you, this is not something that Steve Harvey invented. Okay, this isn't the principle by Steve Harvey. But Psalm 100 verse 4 actually says this. It says, be thankful and say so to him. Okay, did you listen to that? Be thankful and say so to Him. Sometimes we are thankful, but we don't say it. We don't express gratitude. The Bible says, be thankful and say so to Him. The Bible also says this, and we, we, we know this, but we don't always listen to this. We enter His gates with thanksgiving and praise. You see, we don't enter His gates with grumbling and complaining. We enter His gates with thanksgiving. So when we are thankful, when we praise God, that is the way that we enter into His gate. So be thankful and say it. Okay, so say to the person next to you, say it. So I also want you to listen to this scripture, Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7. It says out of the Amplified Bible, do not be anxious or worried. How many of you would like to not be anxious or worried? Okay, I think most of us. Okay, and it says here, about anything, about anything, and then it tells us how to do that. But in everything, okay, every circumstance, every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God and the peace of God that peace which reassures the heart that peace which transcends all understanding that peace which stands God over your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours you see the way to overcome worry and anxiety is to go to God with your prayers and your petitions okay to go to God with your needs and then it says, not just go to God with your, pre, uh, uh, your, your prayers and your petitions, but to go to God with thanksgiving. You see, sometimes we, we don't understand the power of thanksgiving. And this is what this talks about. So, whatever you are trusting God for, write your prayer, write your petition to God, and with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Now, if Marietta says she's going to give me something... You know, when she says to me, listen, I'm going to buy you this gift. What do I do? I say, thank you. Okay, have I received the gift yet? No. 
But I already say thank you because I know that I can trust and I can believe in a character that she is going to do what she has said she is going to do. Okay, I know her, I trust her. So I know that she can do that. So don't we, why can't we do that with God? You know, if I say to Marietta, I don't think you are going to give me that thing that you promised me. I don't think that you are going to do what you said you are going to do. What is she going to say? You spoiled little husband. Okay, maybe not so little, but anyway. Okay, but she, she's not going to give me anything because I'm so ungrateful. You see, and sometimes that's the way that we treat God. We ask God for things that we know is in His will, but then we don't thank Him. We are not thankful. And I don't know if you know this, but thankfulness is actually the highest expression of faith. Thankfulness is the highest expression of faith. And that's what we see with Paul and Silas in the Bible. You know, there was one time where Paul and Silas was in jail. And they didn't pray for God to take them out of the jail. What did they start to do? They started praising God in the jail. They started praising God in the circumstances, in the challenge, in the difficulty. They started praising God. And guess what happened? God opened up the prison doors. God opened up the prison doors. But I want you to notice, they didn't praise God for it. They praised God before it ever came to pass. They were thankful before that. They started praising God for who He was, for what He's done in their lives. And eventually we saw that God opened up the door for them. So don't focus on everything that you lack in life. Start thanking and praising God for what He has already done for you, for what He's about to do. Because I believe this, tough people are thankful people. Can I have an amen? Tough people are thankful people. And that brings me to the second letter of tough, optimistic. Tough people are optimistic people. Say to the person next to you, I am optimistic. Okay, so Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, God says, I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you. God has plans to prosper you, not to harm you. He wants you to know that you have a hope and you have a future. Do you believe that this morning? Now, when we read that verse in context... You know, sometimes people say we quote that verse out of context. You know, you can't just say that. But when you read that verse in context, we actually see that God told His people who were about to go into captivity to accept the captivity. That they were supposed to go into captivity. Don't fight the captors. They were going to be captured by the Babylonians. Okay? In other words, the world system. They were going to be captured by the Babylonians, but God gave them this promise, and this makes this promise even stronger, that in the midst of what they were going through, in the midst of what was happening around them, God said, don't worry, don't fear, I still have good plans for you. I still have a future for you. I still have hope for you. Regardless of the circumstances, God will take care of you. You see, we serve an almighty God. We serve an all-powerful God. And we serve a God that can give you a promotion in a job market where no one is hiring or promoting people. We serve a God that can heal sicknesses and diseases that doctors have no cure for. We serve a God that can save a marriage that no one has hope for. Because listen to this scripture, and I want you to hear this. This is what Jesus said. This is not man's opinion, but this is what Jesus said. Luke 18, 27, he said, The things which are impossible with man are possible with God. Do we still believe in the impossible God? The God who can do the impossible. You see, he is the God of the impossible. You see... Are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? Are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? Do you see the glass half full or do you see it half empty? 
You see, there are people who say sometimes, they say, no, no, I'm not an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, but I'm a realist. You see, but I think that's just a cop-out, because sometimes when people are a realist, all that they're saying is, I'm looking at the circumstances. I'm only taking the circumstances into consideration. When you're an optimist, you take not the circumstances into consideration, but you take the God who is the God of all things into consideration. So, there's something in our brain, and I don't know if you know this, and this is why being optimistic is so important. There's something in our brain called the RAS, okay? The Reticular Activation System, okay? So you can, you can call it your RAS, okay? We all have a RAS in our brain. Now, how that works is that, I don't know if you've ever wanted to buy something, okay? And then what do you do normally? You go and you Google it. And you see, while you're Googling it, you see, okay, maybe you want to buy a red car, a red Volkswagen Golf. Okay, so you go and you Google it. And then all of a sudden, what happens? As you're driving all around you, you see the same car everywhere. Okay, it's, it's amazing. You know, you never saw it before, but all of a sudden, you see it around you everywhere. Okay, and that is actually your reticular activation system in action. You see, what you focus on, you become more aware of. Okay, what you focus on, you become more aware of. So if you are negative, guess what you're going to notice all around you? Negativity. You're going to find nothing to be thankful for. And isn't that exactly how negative people are? They can see nothing positive. They can't see anything positive in any situation because they've trained themselves through this RAS, this reticular activation system, to only see the negative things in life. But now I want you to notice, if you start being optimistic, and this ties in with being thankful, if you start being thankful and optimistic, instead of focusing on what you do have, all of a sudden you will start seeing more things to be thankful for. You will start picking up more things to be grateful for, okay? Because you've trained yourself to see those things. And guess what? Maybe you'll even see an opportunity or two, okay? Where people see something missing, you will see an opportunity. So tough people know that God has plans to prosper them, to give them a hope and a future, regardless the circumstances, and they are optimistic, and they know that tough times won't last, but tough people do. Those who are optimistic and those who are thankful will last, not tough times. And that brings me to the you, unbreakable. Everybody say unbreakable. You see, tough people are unbreakable. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to his purpose. Did you hear that? So, how do you become unbreakable? You become unbreakable by knowing that in all things, good works, uh, God works for the good of those who love him. Those who have been called according to his purpose. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. But... The reality of life is, and this is what I believe God wants us to do, He wants us to learn to trust Him. We have to learn to trust God. Not just trust God for the good things in our lives, because sometimes we think that's what faith is only for, just trusting God for the good things that we want in our lives. But we have to also learn how to trust God during the bad times. You see, if you know that God loves you, you know that no matter what happens in your life, God will turn it around for your good. Okay, but I want you to notice that scripture. We sometimes read that scripture wrong. It doesn't say all things are good. Sometimes we think that everything in our life is good. Everything that happens in our life is only supposed to be good. But the reality is that we live in a broken world. And sometimes the things that happen to us is not good. Losing your job is not good. Becoming sick is not good. But we have to actually read that whole scripture in context to understand it. And it says this, Romans 8 verse 5, 28. I'm reading it from the NIV because it says it so beautifully. It says, but if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. 
In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Do you see there? God helps us. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Okay, you see, you need to pray. We always need to pray. When it's good, we pray. When it's bad, we pray. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Did you know God is praying for you? Holy Spirit is praying for you. And verse 28, And we know, and I want you to listen carefully to the wording, And we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. You see, this is what it actually saying. God will work it out for your good. You see, Job in the Bible, losing his family and everything that he owned wasn't good. But God worked it out for good. The thing that happened to Job wasn't good. We think that everything that happens to us is just good. But bad things is going to happen because we live in a broken world. But God will work it out for good. God works in the terrible circumstances and He works it out for our good. You see, the church being persecuted wasn't good, but God worked it out for good. Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary wasn't good, but God worked it out for good. See, if that didn't happen, where would we all be today? You see, not everything that happens to us is good, but God works it out for our good. So, how many of you have seen that Rocky Balboa clip uh, where he talks to his son? I think it's a very inspirational clip, and I want you to just, I'm going to, I wrote it down, so not all of it, but he talks to his son, and his son actually blames him for all the failures that happened in his life. And then he says to him, and and, and this is in my words, this part, he said, when you were small, I had great expectations for you. He says to his son, when you were small, I had these great expectations for you. And you didn't disappoint me, he said to his son. But you started making your own way in the world. And then he says, but then somewhere along, you stopped being you. You let people stick a finger in your face and tell you that you are no good. And when things got hard, you started looking for someone to blame. Like a big shadow. Let me tell you something. You already know this. The world is not all sunshine and and rainbows. It is a very mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it is not about how hard you hit. It is about how hard you can hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That is how winning is done. Now, if you know what you are worth, then go out there and get what you are worth. But you have to be willing to take the hits and no pointing fingers and saying, you are where you are, uh, you are or you're not where you want to be because of him or her or nobody else. Cowards do that. And that is not you. You're better than that. Isn't that powerful? You see, life is not all sunshine and rainbows. Can I have an amen? When you go through difficult seasons in life, I want to encourage you, like he did with his son, keep going. Remember what Paul said in our scripture. I was beaten with a whip. I was beaten with a rod. I was shipwrecked. I was left for dead. But none of these things move me. None of these things move me. How can Paul say that? Because Paul became unbreakable. He became unbreakable because he realized that tough times don't last. But thankful, optimistic, and unbreakable people do. And that brings me to the G, the growing. Tough people are growing. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within, so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God is for you is good, meets all his demands and move towards the goal of true maturity. You see, sometimes we allow the world to squeeze us into this mold. But 
I want to ask you this morning, do you have a growth mindset? Or do you have a fixed mindset? Do you have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? A fixed mindset is when a person has an approach that learning is about avoiding failure. Okay, so sometimes people don't want to do things because they're afraid they will fail. Okay, but that's a fixed mindset. For example, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you ask a child, draw me a, a, a picture of a house. If I ask... Joshua, for instance, to draw a picture of a house. What will he do? Immediately, he will take a picture, a piece of paper and a pen, and he will start drawing. But when you ask that to an adult, what does an adult say? I'm not an artist. Okay? You see that there's, within a child, there is a growth mindset. Sometimes within adults, because we've been so conditioned by the world, we've developed this fixed mindset. We're afraid to learn. We're afraid to learn from things that happen to us and things that we go through. But God wants us to have a growth mindset. He wants us to learn from the things that we go through. He wants us to learn from life. You see, a growth mindset says, give me time, and though I'm not able to do this right now, I'll work, I'll work toward this goal in the future and I'll make some improvements and I'll be able to do it eventually. A growth mindset is about failing forward. Okay, John Maxwell says you fail forward. You don't fail backward, you fail forward. So even if you make mistakes, you get up, you dust yourself off and you move forward. You get up, you dust yourself off and you keep moving forward. It was Albert Einstein who said, it's not that I'm so smart, it is just that I stay with my problems longer. See, sometimes the problem is not that we don't have the ability, it is sometimes that we don't have the perseverance, okay, the, 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 the determination, the the growth mindset that says that I will learn from this and I will develop myself and I will move forward. We should develop a godly growth mindset. And what I mean about a godly growth mindset is we understand that it is God who gives us the strength to learn from circumstances and to keep moving forward. This godly growth mindset says that we can grow, we can overcome, but it is not with strength that comes from myself. It is not by my own strength, but by the strength that God gives me. It is a godly mindset that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, do we place limits upon God because we assume that something is too hard for Him to accomplish? Luke 1, 37, once again, for with God, nothing is impossible. Say to the person to you, with God, nothing is impossible. You know, it's like a baby eagle. I don't know if you've heard the story about baby eagles and how they learn to fly. But baby eagles spend the first three months of their lives in a comfortable nest that their parents have prepared for them. Then the eagles get a big surprise when they are about 12 weeks old. The mother suddenly begins to throw out all their toys out of the nest. Next, she begins to pull out all the comfortable material in the nest. She pulls out all the, the feathers, the animal fur. And then she leaves the babies sitting on thorns and sticks. And this is actually what the Bible actually talks about. It says that she stirs up her nest. The eagle starts to stir up her nest. The reason she stirs up the nest is that she wants the baby eagle to get out and to start to fly. But before long, the mother eagle then actually starts to nudge this little baby eagle out of the nest. The little eaglets who have no idea to fly, how to fly, fall through the sky and they are probably very frightened. But soon, all of a sudden, they hear this whoosh as the mother eagle comes and she just picks them up on their wings before they hit the ground. And then she takes them up back to the nest and then she just nudges them off again. Okay, why? Because they need to learn how to fly. She keeps repeating the process over and over again until they finally understand that they have no choice but to fly. The mother, mother eagle does this because she loves them and she wants them to have the best that they can possibly have. 
And sometimes in our circumstances, because we are not willing to learn, sometimes the circumstances become difficult. Sometimes because we are not willing to grow beyond where we are, stuff becomes uncomfortable. Okay, and then God will do that. He will start nudging you. He will start pushing you. Okay, because He knows that you need to learn how to fly. Because if you don't learn how to fly, you're going to die. If a baby eagle doesn't learn how to fly, they are going to die. So God sometimes does that. You need to move out of your comfort zone so that God can stretch you and bring you to the place that He has prepared for you. Okay, so have a growth mindset. You have to know that God wants to grow you. So tough times don't last, but people who are thankful, optimistic, unbreakable, and have a growth mindset, who knows that they can do all things through Christ to strengthen them, will last. And that brings me to the last one, hard work. Tough people are H, hard working. Say to the person next to you, I am hard working. Okay, are you hard working? Okay, you see, tough people don't wait for life to happen. They make life happen. Okay, they don't wait for something to come their way. They work until the opportunity comes. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Did you hear that? Whatever your hand finds to do. Sometimes we wait for the perfect opportunity. Listen, God says, whatever you find to do, do it with all your might. That opportunity will create another opportunity. Sometimes we're afraid to take the opportunity because it doesn't look good. Or it isn't the best opportunity. But sometimes God uses that to bring you to the next level. You see, laziness is the enemy of destiny. Laziness is the enemy of destiny. Nothing works unless somebody works. I didn't think I was going to get a lot of amens there. God the Father worked. Okay, do you know that? In the Bible, God the Father worked. Jesus came to finish the work that the Father gave Him. Sometimes, believers come to a place and they do nothing and then they say, no, 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 I'm trusting God. I have faith. Okay, but Jesus is the author and the finisher of faith. He worked, the Father worked, so what kind of faith do you have? If God was willing to work, if Jesus is willing to work, then I believe we should work. You see, where does your faith come from if you don't work? People who place leisure, rest, before labor will be under continual pressure. If you place leisure before work, you will be under continual pressure. And one of the fundamentals of success in life is the force of diligence, the force of work. Life in the kingdom operates on this principle of seed time and harvest time. Okay, that's how it works in the kingdom. Now sometimes people read this and they think it only talks about money. But it also talks about your time, your energy, your resources. Okay, and this is what the Bible says. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly listen if you sow work sparingly you will reap work sparingly okay you have to work you will never get out more than you are willing to invest you will never get out more than you are willing to invest billy graham actually said this he said all temptation comes to those who are idle Elon Musk, you know, sometimes people see him and, you know, he's one of the richest people in the world. He's the second richest, actually. He has 232 billion US dollars to his name. Okay, but what people don't know is that he sometimes works 120 hours a week. They say sometimes when he's, there's a project that he needs to finish, he actually sleeps on the floor until the project is finished by the work that he's busy doing. Now, I'm not saying that we should become workaholics. Okay, not have a balance in our lives. But the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. Sometimes when we go through difficult times, we allow the difficult times to paralyze us, paralyze us into people who become passive. 
Okay, we, we think nothing works, so then we stop working. We hope the situation changes, but we do nothing to make the situation change. And you know what? Once again, the Bible says faith without works is dead. Thomas Edison said the following. He said, sometimes people miss opportunities because they are dressed in overalls. All of us, and he's continued to say this, he says, all of us have great dreams in our minds, and many of us are able to turn those dreams into goals, but only a very few are able to make it happen. And the simple reason is, it takes a lot of hard work. And I want to say this to you, if you're not happy with your life, change it. If you're not happy with your work life, change it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy once again, and it's probably going to be hard, but do something. Work. Work to change your situation. Proverbs 14.23 talks about this. It says, hard work brings profit, but mere talk only leads to poverty. Proverbs 13 verse 4 says, lazy people want much, but get little, but those who work hard will prosper. See, hard work is in the Bible. And I want to say this to you. Tough times don't last. But people who are thankful, people who are optimistic, people who are unbreakable, who have the growth mindset and who work hard, do. So I want to ask you this morning, are you a hard worker? And I want to encourage you this morning, I close with this. I want to encourage you to become tough. The tough times we are going through is not going to last, but the tough will. Those who are thankful, those who are optimistic, those who are unbreakable, those who have a growth mindset, those who are hard workers, the tough times won't last, but you will.